the place I want to start is with an idea uh, uh, that came quite a long time ago uh, from a linguist called Noam Chomsky at MIT. And his idea is that children are basically born knowing language. His idea is that in the human brain, there is a faculty for language. There's knowledge of language, uh, which we're just born with. It's part of our genetic endowment. Uh, and that's why we're so good at it. Obviously, it's not knowledge of any particular language, not knowledge of English or Swahili or something like that. His idea, and this is the very interesting thing he proposed, is that basically all languages, all human languages, are the same underneath the surface. If you look deep enough, they all resemble one another. And then uh, that's the, uh, the knowledge that the child has of this sort of universal pattern behind language. And all they have to do when they're growing up and learning a particular language is to learn how to tweak the universal template and so that it produces English or uh, Russian or, or, or French or, or whatever. Uh, so that's a rather abstract kind of way. I'm going to try and make this uh, idea concrete by taking two languages, uh, which are the most frequent, the most familiar ones to us in New Zealand here. Uh, so uh, that's uh, English and Maori. So let's take a simple sentence, the man grabs the cup. In Maori, uh, you'd say, kararo uh, te tangatai te kapu, or literally translated, grabs the man the cup. So on the surface, they look rather different. They have a different surface word order. Uh, but Chomsky's idea is that underneath the surface, uh, these two languages are actually the same or very similar. So let me show you, first of all, what Chomsky thinks is the underlying kind of complex, deep syntactic structure of the English sentence, the man grabs the cup. You might be surprised how complicated it looks. So look at this. And this is the kind of thing that makes syntax students think, oh my god, do I have to learn this? Don't worry, you don't have to learn this. You don't even have to understand those words like agri -P and IP. The way I want to explain the complexity of this thing is just to tell you, imagine, in your head, you've got a machine, let's say you're all native English speakers, you've got a machine that can produce every single sentence in the English language. How many are they? Well, there's an infinite number, you know, hundreds of thousands, you know, a million, maybe, you know, at least. Uh, so, this diagram that you can see here on, on the screen is a diagram of how that machine that can generate every possible sentence in English generates this particular sentence, the man grabs a cup. And that kind of, I hope, gives you an idea of, of why it's a complicated structure. And linguists spend their time trying to work out what that structure is, what the, what the structure of the machine that can produce all the sentences in the language looks like. Now I want to show you the, the structure of the Maori sentence, the, 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 the translation of this in Maori, if you're a Chomskyan linguist. It looks like this. And what I want to draw your attention to is that the stuff which is in black and white there, the kind of spine of that structure, doesn't change at all. All that's changed is the position where the words appear. And this is the kind of economy and beauty of, of, of Chomsky's model of, of, uh, of innate language, is that basically his idea is that in this spine, there are two possible positions where you can read out the agent of the sentence, uh, the man. And there's two possible places where you can read out the patient, which is the target object, the cup. Uh, and then there's a bunch of different places where you can read out the verb. And the interesting thing about that is that if you imagine that the child knows that innately because it's in their brain somehow, then all they need to do is to learn for their particular language, do they read out the man high or low? Do they read out the cup high or low? And where do they read out grab? And it turns out that just by varying those uh, parameters, you can produce more or less the space of the world's languages. It's a very clean, very beautiful, very simple idea, very, very influential. Unfortunately, not everyone believes this. So, there's a big problem. Chomsky came up with this idea purely by looking at sentences and trying to work out grammars that generated sentences. He never looked actually inside the brain, even though his theory predicts stuff about what's in the brain. And if you look in the brain, as we can do now, and he couldn't, and we look for these language-specific structures, we don't see them. Uh, so he predicts they're there, and yet we don't find them. So what's going on? In fact, when we look at the brain, at the parts of the brain which are active when uh, someone's speaking, or, or someone's hearing uh, language, we find that it's the same areas which are active when we just undergo ordinary experience of the world. For instance, when we look around and see objects or interact with objects, those same areas of the brain are active. So to take an example, uh, which relates to my cup-grabbing sentence, uh, if you look at a cup, there's a particular area of the brain that activates. I'm, I'm simplifying, but just imagine it's there. The interesting thing is that if you don't look at a cup, but you just hear someone say the word cup, you could have your eyes closed, uh, that same area of the brain lights up. And so it's as though when you hear the word cup, what you're doing is simulating the experience of seeing a cup. And that makes sense, really, because that's maybe why the word cup means what it does, because we have experience of cups, and the word cup evokes that experience. It's the same with uh, 
a man. If you see a man, there's some slightly different area of the brain that lights up. And again, when you hear the word man, that same area lights up. And so the, the words are evoking the sensory experience. And uh, the final part of the sentence is grabbing. Uh, when you execute a grab movement, uh, there's a particular area of the brain lights up, some part of motor cortex or premotor cortex. Something which is really interesting, uh, which we've only discovered fairly recently, is that when you watch someone else grabbing a cup, it turns out that that same motor area of the brain lights up. And that's why it is that when you're watching a football game and someone kicks a ball, you can't help but kick. I'm sure you've all had this experience. It's because when you watch uh, an action, your own motor system is kind of triggered by that. And that's, again, maybe why we understand the meaning of those words. And uh, yeah, um, so if you hear the word grab, then that same area of the brain lights up. So um, modern uh, neuroscientists tend to be skeptical about Chomsky because they don't find this universal uh, grammar that he talks about. Instead, they find uh, this idea that, that language is basically piggybacking on, on the sensory motor system, that basically there's sensory motor circuitry in the brain and language is developed on top of that. So that's the question uh, that I uh, have been interested in, uh, and uh, I've spent a long time uh, researching this and have uh, recently written a book which is coming out this month, uh, all about this, and the, the focus of the book is on this one simple action of grabbing a cup. Uh, and I'm going to go through this in a lot of detail now, uh, and I'm going to try, think about it, it's a very quick action, you do it very fast, and you, I want, you know, you're probably doing this uh, cup grabbing action pretty shortly, uh, and when you do it, I want you to think about uh, all the things that are going on. So let me give you a really uh, sort of contextualized example of grabbing a cup. Uh, something which is like a natural environment for grabbing a cup in Dunedin. <laughs> uh, so, here's a guy, and he's reaching for a cup. Uh, the first thing that's happening is that he has to decide uh, to do an action at all. Uh, he could have done lots of things when he was sitting there at the bar. He could have had a memory about what happened yesterday. He could have been planning his shopping list for the evening. He could have been watching a TV in the corner. But instead, he decided, I'm going to, grab, I'm going to do something. And when he decides he's going to do something, basically, his whole uh, brain gets put into a special mode, which is like action mode. And in that mode, everything that he sees in his environment is a potential target object that he could do something with. And he's got all these competing actions uh, that he can do. And in that situation, interestingly enough, he attends to himself as an agent. One of our representations of ourselves as agents is as uh, agents who can initiate actions, who can start to do things. And so when he decides to do an action, even before he's decided which one it is, he attends to himself. The next thing he has to do is to decide what action to do. So if you imagine, there's various different objects in the scene that he could reach, and they're all shouting to him in his, in his brain, grab me, grab me, do something with me, do something with me. And there's a competition that goes on, uh, and at a certain point, the competition gets resolved. And at that point, what does he do? He looks around and chooses an object. Now, <laughs> even though this is a kind of a video put together for the purpose of scientific visualization. I think it's got a certain beauty to it. If you just look at it as an image, uh, there's something Holy Grail-like about this. Uh, <laughs> so he's looking at the cup. So basically, if you try this, try this at home. When you grab a cup, you look at it first, and then you reach for it. Uh, so it's only when he, swiv he uh, swivels his eyes around and fixates the cup and generates a representation of the cup, which is nice and clear because it's in the middle of his visual field, and. Uh, now he's got enough information to work out exactly how to reach it. So now we'll start to monitor his reach action. In great detail, this is Natural History New Zealand's camera. Uh, so now what he's doing is activating that area that I showed you in the motor cortex, which is planning and generating a reach to grasp action. Very difficult to do if you uh, try to build this in a robot. And humans are amazingly good at it. Uh, but the interesting thing that I want to draw your attention to is that while he's in the middle of making this action, it turns out that he activates a representation of himself as a side effect of that. And think about that. Another conception of ourselves comes from our body as it's moving. And when we're, when we're moving and making an action, uh, we know what it feels like uh, to move. And that's part of our representation of our own bodies. So he, his attention is drawn back to himself. Finally, uh, he completes the action. And at the point where he completes the action, his attention is drawn back to the cup, but this time again in a different way. The first time he attended to the cup, it was because he was looking at it. The second time, it's because he's touching it. Uh, so the representation he gets at the end is, is in the modality of touch. He knows where it is because he's, he knows where his hand is, and he knows what, what shape it is because he knows what shape his fingers are, are making. 
Uh, so that's the awareness of a, of a touch. I mean, an object uh, is partly a visual representation, but also partly a, a tactile representation. We know what it feels like to touch the object. We're now going to uh, replay this whole thing from a slightly different perspective, the perspective of an observer. Uh, and the interesting thing that's been discovered in, in neuroscience in the past few years is that actually, in the mind of that observing woman, uh, the scenario is completely the same. Uh, and I'll just go through it now. Watch very carefully the slow motion. And now we're watching her, okay, not him. So what happens is he starts to move, and that makes him a salient object in her visual field. And she looks round. It's quite... Actually, it's not a very difficult acting job. Uh, all I had to do was to say, you grab the cup and you watch. Okay, <laughs> it's not very difficult to do. Um, he's now, she's now looking at him, so she's attended to the agent, and then she's got a representation of him as a result. And now watch. Where does she look next? The next thing she does, and again, you can try this. She doesn't look at his hand. She looks where he's looking. She basically anticipates his intention and looks where he's looking. This is a situation called joint attention. They're both looking at the same object. And it's only at that point that she can really successfully monitor his action, because she needs to know not just how his hand is moving, but how it's moving in relation to the intended target. So at this point, uh, she's able to activate in her own motor cortex a representation of the grasp action that she thinks is underway. But the interesting thing is that while she's monitoring this action, she's also uh, reattending to him. So he is now uh, being represented in her peripheral vision uh, as an animate agent, as a pattern of movement. Again, he's not just a salient object in her world now. Uh, he's a particular uh, agent with a ca particular characteristic pattern of movement. And finally, at the very end, when he grabs the cup, uh, she looks at that and she uh, reattends to the cup. And uh, since this is quite thirsty work, I think uh, we'll let him actually drink. <laughs> Cheers. So, um, yeah, that's the action. Let me summarize that for you. Because even though it's very complicated in terms of the neural processes that are going, there's a huge amount going on. Actually, at a certain level of abstraction, we can simplify quite well. Uh, we attend to the man, then we get a representation of the man. We attend to the cup, we get a representation of the cup. We execute a grab program, we reattend to the man, and finally, we reattend to the cup. Now, imagine what happens. If you watch an event like that, and you store it in your memory, and then you replay it in simulation, because that's what's uh, supposed to be the connection with language, if you believe the simulation people. So in order to represent the event, uh, you can actually store it as a sequence of planned sensory motor operations uh, in a particular part of the brain. And we know quite a lot about how they're planned uh, and stored. And in particular, the motor action, the planned motor action, is very uh, strongly stored. And now think about the replay action. Uh, we attend to the man. Uh, we get a representation of man, tend to cup, cup, tend to grab, man again, and then cup. So the very interesting thing about that is that if we now take this sensory motor structure and we compare it, this is what uh, the, my main interest is uh, in, if you compare that to the syntactic structure of the sentence, the man grabbed a cup, you find something very interesting. You find basically that there is a very close correspondence between these two structures. In fact, every single item in the, sy in the uh, syntactic structure corresponds to exactly one sensory motor operation. Uh, so these correspondences actually run very deep, much deeper than I'm showing you here. And they uh, make this very interesting hypothesis uh, uh, available, which is that Chomsky, when he was studying uh, human language, might have actually been studying the sensory motor system without knowing it. Maybe uh, Chomsky and the sensory motor people are both right because Chomsky and syntactic structures actually are descriptions of sensory motor processing. So if that's the case, then we're in this very interesting situation which scientists like, where you have two completely separate disciplines uh, which are found to actually overlap. And that's very nice to know because now suddenly by studying linguistics you can find out things about the sensory motor system, and by studying the sensory motor system you can find out things about linguistics. So. Uh, that's very nice for the scientists, but how does it uh, relate to what we do and, and you know, general uh, people in life, and how is it going to relate to them? Well, um, it's very important for science to throw out and spin off the technologies, things that help people. And like I've already mentioned, there are already um, uh, systems that generate text 
you know, produce uh, human-like uh, sentences and so on. So I've given the example of uh, a sat-nav, or you might imagine airport announcement systems, which are also just generated. But those are very simple generation systems. What I want to talk about in a bit more detail is a more complicated one, uh, which is uh, produced by some uh, colleagues uh, in the University of Aberdeen. And the reason why I like this is that it has a really practical uh, medical benefit. And it's in uh, the domain of neonatal intensive care, a little bit like the previous speaker was talking about, in fact. Um, so in one of these ICU units, a baby is uh, um, um, monitored by lots and lots of technology. Uh, there are all sorts of devices that are connected to them. It's a very technology-heavy situation. Uh, and while that's all very important medically, uh, for the family of the baby, it's extremely uh, upsetting and, and alienating and worrying because when they want to know how their baby is doing, uh, the information that the doctors are using actually looks like this, and it makes no sense to them whatsoever. Uh, so uh, Ehud Reiter and colleagues at Aberdeen produced this fantastic system called Baby Talk, which takes data like that, takes a data stream like that, and turns it into something like that. And when you see that, it's as though your own heart rate goes down. It's like, oh, so that's what's happening. You know, this is language that we understand. So um, this technology is much more advanced than the simple template-based uh, system that you saw before. Um, but what I want to do is to uh, consider how we can improve even these systems, because we're going to see a lot more of these, and there needs to be some basic research done here. And my suggestion is that maybe what you should do is to try making a generation system that behaves like a baby and learns language like a baby. Uh, so this is work that's done in collaboration with two wonderful colleagues at Otago, Martin Takac and Lubica Beniskova. Uh, and what we've done is to create a, a natural language generation system that's like a, a, a simulated baby, if you want. So one of the characteristics of this uh, system is that it's a neural network. We've already heard a little bit about neurons today. Uh, so we simulate neurons connected together, uh, and these networks of neurons can learn. Uh, so this uh, um, system has no specific knowledge about language, but it does have knowledge about the sensory motor system. It's like a baby who can move and, and watch, uh, but doesn't yet know language. Uh, and then what we do is to give it training data where sensory motor sequences are paired with sentences, and they could be sentences in any language, basically. Uh, and what happens is that this uh, system rather organically uh, learns to pair the sensory motor sequences with sentences, and then can start speaking uh, new uh, sensory motor sequences and describing its sensory motor experience. So I'll just very quickly finish by saying, uh, imagine we have our simulated baby at the age of six months. Uh, this is just a picture of the baby. Um, so uh, at this age, it can't really produce any, any language at all. It's, it produces the computer equivalent of Gaga and Gugu. Uh, a bit later on, though, it starts to be able to produce single words. And a bit later, it starts to be able to produce pairs of words, simple two-word phrases like uh, cup grab or, or man see, things like that. And finally, at the point where its sensory motor memory matures, uh, it's able to produce fully inflected sentences with uh, deterministic word orders, things which look a little bit like the language of a three-year-old who suddenly switched on to how syntax works. Uh, so we hope that by uh, extending this technology, we might end up being able to build natural language generation systems that behave a little bit more like the way people do and communicate better with people. <laughs>